uh, infrastructure and application modernization. Along with me, we have three other uh, honorable guest speakers. Uh, I'd like them to introduce themselves as well. Uh, why don't we start with you, James? Hi, everybody. Thanks for making the time to join us today. I'm James Norvell, Delivery Product Manager at CloudReach. Uh, I've got nearly two decades of experience helping map customers to solutions, and that's generally been around infrastructure deployment and data center transformation. So I uh, look forward to, to talking more. Awesome. Thank you, James. Wesley? Hi there, my name is Wesley Chung. I'm a senior partner development specialist here at AWS. So, so I work with partners, uh, specifically CloudReach, to um, get customers their database modernization projects deployed successfully and find opportunities to take advantage of what we offer on AWS. Thanks, Wesley. Jason? Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Berry. I'm a senior solutions architect with AWS. I also support CloudReach. Uh, honored to be here today. Um, of today's webinar. So thanks for having me. Awesome. Let's jump right into it. So today's agenda, I'm going to cover what database modernization and optimization is about and when's the proper time to do so. I'm also going to be talking about some of the pain points and benefits of the database modernization. Also, we're going to be looking at two customer case studies that we help them um, migrate and modernize their um, databases. And we're going to be wrapped up with the Q&A session in the end. Let's start with a bit of definition. Um, database modernization is the process of refactoring your applications and underlying databases with purpose-built uh, data solutions that help drive your uh, business outcomes. And your existing applications architected on the traditional relational database management system may work well before, uh, but the changing query patterns and the unpredictable traffic um, warrants a database modernization. So an example would be uh, converting your relational database to a NoSQL database like uh, DynamoDB, DocumentDB, MongoDB. Um, to do that is to achieve uh, low latency, high scalability, um, and the flexibility, right? So where you have a row of records with infinite amount of columns to store your structured or unstructured data like voice, text, uh, JSON files, so on and so forth, right? Uh, it really changes the query structure and schema design of the traditional relational database. And secondly, uh, database optimization, uh, it's sort of the incremental approach of moving the legacy databases to new platforms uh, for better scalability, lower TCO or fully managed services uh, to limit the undifferentiated head lifting. And all that with minimal changes on the application you run on, right? So an exact example would be to do a lift and a shift migration from your on-prem database to EC2 instance. Um, and later on, we platform to a fully managed service like Amazon Aurora or RDS. Right? In, addition, in addition to that, uh, you can also add it in memory layer um, like Elastic Cache uh, for higher read and write capabilities, especially if you need real-time analytics, um, geospatial apps like Uber or Lyft, uh, media streaming, session store, shopping carts, uh, chatbot, so on and so forth. So those are some uh, use cases for in-memory caching. And for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to be referring both uh, database modernization and optimization as modernization, um, just for simplicity's sake. Next, when it's a good time to modernize, right? So your database, there's a lot of things revolved around it, your uh, financials information, software applications, business logic, customer information, so on and so forth, right? So database modernization doesn't happen in isolation. Um, they, they typically happen when um, there's leadership or strategy change take place, right? Uh, we're talking about having someone who has this cloud IQ and vision and who has someone uh, successfully led to a digital transformation in the past, uh, who has a cloud first mandate mentality and is a huge proponent to work with partners and CSP and GSI partners alike, like CloudReach. Um, so for example, CloudReach has gone through emergent acquisition or actually Atlas acquired CloudReach and Maven Waves um, so they've been traditionally been a, a data center uh, management company. They've acquired us at Maven Waves uh, to boost, boost up their uh, presence in the cloud space. Second, a, a modernization usually follows from a large migration, right? Um, so it is a department-wide refactoring of their applications or infrastructure, right? Especially the company have a long and continuous modernization horizon. Uh, they see the need for continuous innovate the want and want to seize the opportunity window. It could be a cloud-only initiative or hybrid environment 
like we've seen in many cases, um, they just want to move a certain workload um, to the cloud first and then figure out what to do next, right? So if there's some mission critical uh, production workloads, they might need to take some time to write the application, and so on and so forth. And third, it could be event driven. If you uh, have a downtime, you have a customer complaint, a latency issue, security breach, or uh, the great resonation we're seeing during COVID time, right? So you really need to upgrade your technology stack to attract those talents, right? And the study is shown by Akamai have shown that um, a 100 millisecond delay in a website load time can hurt your conversion by nearly 7%, or two second delay in the web page load time uh, increases the bounce rate by 103%. So those are some whopping numbers that uh, prompt a lot of retail companies to take a closer look at their performance on their um, databases. Lastly, license renewal, uh, usually between five to eight months uh, before the uh, license renewal date, companies want to sit down and renegotiate, renegotiate for better terms before they want, they want to lock in for another four years and they want to evaluate our terms, obviously, right? So this relates to the database freedom play, which we have, which is to leverage uh, the open source database engines like MySQL or PostgreSQL, right, to save on licensing costs. In the device support, uh, usually there's a limited period for support on certain versions that you run on. Uh, once the support is deprecated, uh, you have to pay a half a fee to support older version. Uh, so by modernizing, keeping on top of the game, you sort of having this managed services, um, you, you're like RDS or Aurora, you no longer have to worry about um, being locked into um, you know, the supporting period dictated by the vendor. And typical customer pain points, uh, here I've grouped the common pain points into three broad categories. They can be cost-related, performance-related, or risk-related. So for cost-related, um, as mentioned earlier, commercial database vendors uh, try to lock you in for as long as they, as they can, and the customers often have no choice but to oblige. Or they want to upsell you with the addition that comes with the features or support you don't need or aren't even aware of. Um, your DBA overhead costs a big chunk of the tech spend, right? If your database administrator is spending too much time on the low level activities, like the patching, upgrade, maintenance, a backup, right? Stuff like that, the cost can add up. Um, if you do it manually, uh, you might have over provision in instances and that results in the unnecessary spend. As for performance, if you're running on legacy systems, so your chances are you might experience a high latency, unplanned downtime, um, data infidelity, which can hurt your company's bottom line. So if you're manually provision a service and just can't, you just can't keep up with spikes in demand, right? And it results in um, losing customers. And lastly, risk related. Um, so what if vendors announce that the version of your database is no longer being supported? And you're forced to upgrade and purchase new licenses as we've seen in many cases. Um, it's always a risk to convert and migrate production grade databases, right? Especially if you don't have the right talent experience in house. Um, also if you're using proprietary software, it really limits your uh, opportunity to pivot to other technologies. Um, so lastly, and also there's a, a chance that a vendor might slap you with an audit letter, uh, which is uh, usually painful and it's time consuming. There's a lot of legal back and forth and may eventually uh, hand you down with a big uh, true up billing to you, right? As we sort of talk about the what, the when, and the why you should modernize your database, um, let's dig in a little to ask the experts on this, on this channel here think what the trend is in, in, the, in the coming years. Um, so I'm going to turn to uh, Wesley. Uh, so what are some of the trends and stats you're seeing in the market for the next couple of years? Thanks, Kyle. Um, so why don't we start with just broad macro trends, which are not specific to databases. And if we look at uh, some of the common trends, you're all familiar with the fact that data is growing exponentially. Um, I've heard various statistics. Uh, I think the one that for me is the most easily relatable is that uh, by AWS's estimates, every five years, you're seeing about 10 times more data created. And this is obviously from the proliferation of edge devices, mobile devices, social media as a, as a content source, et cetera, et cetera. I think what's more interesting around data growth, though, is um, that Forbes did an analysis and they said that for a typical Fortune 1000 company, if they can make 10% of their business data more accessible within their organization, uh, they, that organization will typically see something like $65 million increase in net income or an average growth rate of about 30% or more year over year annually. So um, obviously taking advantage of the data that an organization is 
creating and also has access to to make the business more enabled is is critical for success. I think we're also seeing across the board organizations shifting to more of a microservices architecture, and this is driving um, in terms of how, te how teams are organized a decoupling between teams and the functionality that they're responsible for. So no longer are you sort of beholden to various dependencies across different parts of your application stack, but each team is able to uh, iterate more quickly, enhance their microservices that they're responsible for. And then this ties to the, the third point in, on the macro trends, which is DevOps velocity. The developers are basically able to choose the tools that make them most effective. And because what they're building is self-contained and abstracted from other teams, um, that choice is, is more critical, right? Because they're now able to pick whatever is going to make sense for them and they're not um, obligated to use whatever the organization has picked in the past. And now that if we take the, those macro trends and kind of convert them into some of the database trends we're seeing, what we're noticing is that as customers realize that they're basically inefficient from a productivity standpoint, if they're managing their own databases, um, if instead they can shift the work to an organization like AWS to manage the databases, their DBAs, as an example, can manage about 60% more databases per DBA than they would have if they had to self-manage. Um, they're realizing benefits like 97% less unplanned downtime, uh, performance and optimization happens at a, at a better rate. So they're seeing things like 34% less latency between the database and the applications. So basically the, the resources that are available within an organization are able to focus on higher value work, like optimizing the applications, designing for those applications and then executing on um, uh, the, the business value aspects of, of the, uh, the programs that they're involved in. Organizations are obviously able to optimize their spend because like Kyle mentioned, they're able to reduce things like license costs. And they're also able to reduce infrastructure costs, uh, letting someone like AWS, who has sort of economies of scale and global reach, uh, manage the infrastructure build out for them. And then you'll, you'll hear more about this in the webinar, but one of the things we're definitely noticing with customers is this DevOps um, developer's choice, the shift to microservices, and the ability to not always let the database decision choose how the use cases are implemented, but in, in reverse, instead, let the use cases drive the selection of the database technologies. You're seeing a use case focus uh, amongst customers for picking the tools they want to use on a database level. So as you begin to think about how you might leverage these trends yourselves, uh, what I would kind of highlight for you is one, um, think about cloud databases as a, a mechanism to Realize value sooner, right? You can get deployed very quickly. You can also pay for only what you need or what you use. Uh, you can get access to purpose-built databases. Um, and you'll hear more about this as well, about how Amazon ourselves decided to move away from relational databases for certain use cases because the relational uh, capabilities didn't meet our needs. And then as you're thinking about how to get started, make sure you're working with partners like CloudReach who are skilled and have demonstrated expertise because every situation is gonna be a little bit different. You want someone who has um, a prescriptive approach and has tools to help you get to success as quickly as possible and with as little risk as possible. Great, yeah, um, definitely there's a lot of benefits to um, you know, modernizing your database, right? Seeing these trends. And, and if the, let's look at the micro level, right? If the customer wants to leverage a trend, what's some of the journeys uh, that you go through? Um, James, do you wanna take that? Yeah, thanks, Kyle. So we're, we're seeing three patterns, broadly speaking, emerge. Uh, the first one is this idea of move to managed, and, and it's really about uh, right-sizing uh, the platforms and how they're managed. So we've seen past technologies that most of us have seen and lived through, uh, innovations like server virtualization that provided us faster delivery times, scalability, and also reduced the cost and maintenance burden because the physical server footprint was greatly reduced. Um, and we had higher dense workloads we were able to manage as a result of that. And so we've also seen how cloud technologies offer increased speed, agility, and the on-demand consumption model that, that helps us meet the uh, elasticity of demand uh, for, our, for uh, your, your workloads in, in the cloud. Uh, but there's additional opportunity to optimize databases um, so we talked about a little bit, um, managed database services, 
in AWS can remove the admin burden of patching, things like monitoring, backups, uh, and can greatly simplify database failover and disaster recovery and taking that burden off your shoulders and your DBA teams. And that frees them up to focus on database design and application features and supporting those things that drive the value for, for your business. So CloudReach has been helping companies move some of their most critical commercial and open source database workloads to these relational database managed services to unlock this value. The second trend we're seeing is this idea of breaking free of, of legacy uh, or also known as database freedom. And so anyone who's been responsible for the total cost of ownership of application workloads knows that commercial database licensing is often one of the most expensive factors. And when you start to add the incremental cost to achieve goals like business resiliency and disaster recovery, those database licensing costs multiply quickly and can often spiral out of control. Our teams have over a decade of experience helping companies actually convert their commercial databases and getting off those licensing structures to open source relational database engines. And we've got a variety of tools and methods and tricks to help do that. Uh, after that successful conversion, the outcome of moving those databases to manage technologies like Amazon Aurora, for example, can help companies achieve performance of commercial grade databases at one tenth the cost. And then the third pattern that's emerging that, that we've touched on as well is this idea of modernizing by design and moving to purpose-built data structures. This, this is for when your workloads have reached the limits of relational database management systems. It's the next modernization wave, this idea of microservices or, or loosely coupling your data access patterns and moving it into NoSQL workloads based on the use case. NoSQL is a set of concepts that allows rapid and efficient processing of the data with a focus on performance, reliability, and agility. CloudReach can help identify specific database functions that have reached these limits and help move them to purpose-built technologies that are highly distributed with massive scaling and performance benefits. And the way we do this is we run discovery workshops. So we'll partner with your team, identify where the performance pain points are, and then help you create a business case so that you can build a roadmap to help your business move forward to the right technology and tools at the right time. That's good. So you mentioned the three paths that the customer could potentially take to modernize their databases. And what was CloudReach doing in helping the customers to make this, this decision? Yeah, so, so we, we wanna come in and make sure that we have uh, an approach that, that uh, is prescriptive in, in nature. And so our aim is to be a strategic partner across the customer journey. We understand there's challenges, you know, you've got cross-functional teams, you've got, a, you've got a, to support a portfolio of applications. And so our advisory team can meet with, with, uh, with those stakeholders to help fill in the gaps with our experience and partnerships like with AWS. Uh, our advisory team and database experts can partner with those stakeholders to deliver a roadmap of high impact ideas to get you guys started. So this allows us to help leverage that expertise uh, throughout your, your journey. And then that way we can have a holistic approach to deliver incremental impact to your business. One, one of the ways that we sometimes get started is this idea of database modernization quick start. And this is for companies that either already have databases on AWS accounts, or they're in the process of migrating to AWS and they wanna get started fast. In our assess phase, we leverage proprietary software like Cloudomize and Sunstone to accelerate identifying the low hanging fruit that makes sense to modernize. Our software can quickly access the database landscape and then uses automation and deep, deep database metric insights to, to uh, quickly get through this process and, and find the right things. Then we go into our plan and design phase and here's where we leverage our experience and then your unique requirements that we identify to build the business case to deliver an initial proof of value. We design a solution using considerations like connectivity, business availability, and then also your data and compliance security requirements to make sure we select the right tools and teams for the job. Finally, in the modernization phase, uh, we execute the plan. We use proven delivery patterns 
that we've battle tested in the past. And we provide a lighthouse database modernization service. And we found this proof of value approach provides stakeholders the confidence they need to get some quick wins. And then we can continue along that modernization journey where we can keep helping you manage along the way and also help you with ongoing managed services where it makes sense. Got it. And now, now we've seen the delivery model, um, but as a customer, I'm kind of worried about uh, how do you ensure that minimal, there's minimal disruption um, when engaging with CloudReach because I can't afford to have you know, two days of downtime to modernize my databases. Yeah, it's a good question. So I'd, I'd say the first step is making sure that you've got the right foundation in AWS and that the right architecture teams are involved. A lot of companies ask CloudReach for help validating their cloud landing zone and also helping develop the infrastructure automation that's needed, right? So, so most, most of us heard of infrastructure as code. So whether it's Terraform or whatever the technology is, having a way to quickly deploy those services uh, that they need for success is key uh, to have those foundations for, for that we want to build on with, with database modernization. Um, and then I'd say our, our assess and plan phases ensure that we understand the uh, right considerations before getting started. Um, I think I mentioned before, you know, having all the right people involved and aligned are, is critical. And then the other key is, you know, making sure we pick the right tools for the job, making sure that we're using the, the right uh, native tooling for backups, for example, uh, if we're backing up and restoring a database, make, making sure that we pick the right thing. Uh, and then starting first with non-production workloads and then making sure that there's a good test plan. Um, and I can't, can't stress that enough. Uh, once, once you've deployed this and, and you've got the good plan, just testing it again and again, because we're talking about the infrastructure components and the database services, but you need to have an end-to-end -end way to test your app on some sort of production readiness platform to make sure that uh, it's going to be successful when you do the, the production cutover. And then I'd say if your data is not already in the cloud, it's really important to make sure you've got the right connectivity, especially if there's a larger database. And so that could be a VPN, uh, it could be something like Amazon Direct Connect, just what, whatever's required based on your, your needs. And because the idea is that data is changing very quickly. So as we test the target solution, we need to make sure we have got a good understanding of how long it takes that data to replicate uh, so that you can minimize those customer change windows. Got it, right. Um, and obviously we work with closely with AWS. I want to hear from the AWS side what has worked well in the past. Uh, Jason, do you want to take that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and James covered a lot of that. And, and I want to kind of drill into, you know, the agility of the cloud, how you can build out those non-prod environments using infrastructure as code. You not only can deploy quickly to experiment, continue to innovate, but then you want to fail fast. And, and as you fail fast, and if you're using infrastructure as code, it's easy enough to, as you build it up, you tear it down. Or if you're maybe not that mature from an automation standpoint, there's still a number of AWS solutions that will allow you to power off EC2 instances, you know, only when you're in the office or, or, or when you need to. And, um, you know, from a cost perspective, that's huge. Uh, the, the biggest part too is you can also proof out other things in those designs as you're experimenting, whether you want to use serverless or get into you know other buzzwords like you know introduce chaos engineering or, or get into things that you normally wouldn't be able to get into because you're no longer doing that heavy undifferentiated lifting uh because you're not focused on you know that 800 pound gorilla database cluster that's over there just drooling at you and it's it's all about the uh, the data at that point and you know to that point we have the schema conversion tools, the database migration services, not only for testing or getting to a non-disruptive cutover, but you can leverage different application logic and you can experiment with that using those replication features. Uh, Amazon, uh, there's a white paper from AWS at amazon.com and they were going through the same journey, uh, modernizing from Oracle to NoSQL. They were able to take a three-prong approach to, to get to that non-disruptiveness. And, you know, real quickly, it's, you know, ensure you have the correctness and the scale that you need. Then you can almost use it as like a, a staging, a practice ground to find issues as if it was production. And then lastly, you got your cutover where you're cutting over live rights. And then on the, in the backside, 
uh, database migration service can can backfill the data that's uh, that was existing in the database prior to. So there's lots of options there. Got it. Definitely, you mentioned a lot of technology. It's very advanced for a lot of customers and. A lot, of, a lot of customers we talked to, um, they were like, yeah, yeah, we move the database to the cloud. We're good, we're good hands. What, what do you do with that? Like, are they in, actually in, in a good uh, situation there? Yeah, so, and, and one thing, this NoSQL, this modernization thing that we're on, I wanna be clear, this is, this is not the next shiny thing. This is literally the, the next iteration of innovation, breaking off what you have like the tools are here for you to innovate and grow. Um, and, and you have those non-production partners to test this out. Uh, understand that that skill is, a, is, is a, a commodity, a database skill. If you have that group already, you can still maintain all those skills and, and slowly build into this modernization practice. 70% um, of the workload that Amazon.com found was key value in nature. They still had use cases for the other 30% with MySQL and Postgres. And those databases still existed. So you still need that skill. This doesn't replace any of that. It's just a better way to have the right tool for the right job and ultimately just provide better business value to your customers. Yeah, totally makes sense. Okay, let's moving on. Let's talk about some case studies, right? There's some great discussion that we have there, right? Um, so there are a number of customers who help migrate their workloads to the cloud. Um, many of them have taken the, the incremental approach of doing a lift and shift first, and then look for ways to modernize their non-production applications or databases. Um, so there are two customers we find uh, quite relevant and interesting and thought they could be exemplary uh, if you're thinking about database modernization, right? So the first one is a risk management company that writes uh, life insurance policies. Um, CloudReach hosted a data strategy workshop, uh, which is a six week engagement where we review their entire data landscape to build a data modernization roadmap um, based on high impact opportunities. Uh, we partner with their customers portfolio teams to review current state, possible future state and perform a gap analysis. Um, so they have a high demand for CDC uh, change data capture which essentially means identifying and capturing changes made to the data in a database, and then deliver those changes in a real time to a downstream processor system. And so we move their database to Amazon Aurora via um, beta migration service. Uh, the data changes are captured in the S3 buckets and flow to Redshift. And eventually they want to use QuickSight for analytical and reporting purposes. Uh, there's currently download report of the Excel spreadsheet, uh, which is not a good practice because it's, it's stale. It's not a single source of truth. It's not no real time updates. So the ultimate goal is to get away from Excel flat files um, and move to um, QuickSight. Um, so we, we built this pipeline strategy um, to help process and consume the data in the and turn this into valuable actions. Uh, the customer is taking this recommendation to the board and decide what to do with the with their current challenges, right? Um, and the, the assessments actually only take six days, right? Even though it's a six week um, uh, engagement. So I just wanna stress that the time, it's, we can drastically reduce the time um, to understand the lay of the land, your overall IT landscape within just a few days, right? So it's usually one third of the time compared to other competitors. And the second customer we worked on, it's an online travel agency and that has some number of legacy MySQL databases. Uh, and scaling to database during peak season was becoming a challenge. Uh, in addition to that, they had limited in-house database resources. Uh, so they decided to partner with CloudReach to support their DevOps activities. Uh, they needed a partner to manage their infrastructure and applications. Uh, so one of the things we did was to upgrade their database version to the minimum uh, version that's being supported by MySQL RDS uh, and migrated data to, uh, via VMS. And the migration was pretty straightforward uh, since it was a like-for-like -like migration uh, with no schema conversion. Uh, so we started with the non-production uh, to prove out the process before moving to production workloads. And by moving to MySQL RDS, uh, a lot of what CloudReach used to do on their behalf has been largely freed up. So we're now more focused on moving to production workloads uh, to manage database services. And the project is still in flight, but the customer is delighted to see some early results. Uh, so it's some great wins right there. Um, so those are two companies that uh, yeah, we work for. 
uh, to modernize the databases. Um, and also encourage the audience to put their question in the chat. Um, so we'll have a Q&A session in the end. Okay, and the power of the three. So the combination of uh, AWS, Cloud Reach, and Atos uh, together we're going to form a greenest, the greenest, most secure, and a cloud native GSI worldwide, right? So no longer you have this IT-led adoption for cloud. So we're moving towards a large scale, all encompassing organizational transformation initiatives driven by business use cases uh, and then customer demand, right? And that is to have modernized design with security best practices in place uh, for new ways of working, building long lasting sustainable uh, environments. And the last point here actually coincide, coincides with AWS newly added pillar on sustainability all right, in the well-architected framework. And these are the top four mandates uh, we're trying to, to, to strive towards too. And the middle section, there's just some of the uh, rewards we received over the years. And obviously we wanna keep working uh, with AWS and other CSPs to achieve more, accumulate more uh, certifications and, and, and more programs. And by working with some large enterprises and governments and so on and so forth. And that is the end of the presentation. Uh, is there any question at Q&A session? Hey Kyle, it looks like there's a couple questions, uh, and I encourage the audience to uh, go ahead and submit more um, since we have some time for discussion. Um, but the first question is, uh, I have a, an Oracle database that I'm self-managing. Is it possible to move it to AWS in a managed form and then later move off Oracle? Sure. Uh, James, you want to take that? Uh yeah, that's a great question, and and um, I, you know, I'd say that in that assess and plan phase, we want to make sure that we're moving things at the right time, right? But often, often, if if there's an opportunity to convert um, Oracle to an open source database platform, we will do an initial lift and shift, um, and depending on the requirements, we can go ahead and put it on an Oracle RDS, right? Um, and and that actually is something that. It's probably, I would say, more common. <laughs> we get the data up there first. We get it in this managed structure. Um, and then we can use things like schema conversion tool that AWS has. And we've got some other tools uh, that we've used to, to quickly identify if it's going to be easy, moderate, or difficult to convert that, right? And there is some time and a lot of testing that goes into that. So, so I would say you can absolutely um, get things where they need to be and get them managed first. Um, and then at the right time, break free of that legacy licensing. And so we can work with you to figure out, you know, when that time is and, and, and what the right approach is. Got it, thanks. And I also believe we have a practice for a uh, Microsoft SQL server as well, right? Correct, yeah, we can help you with SQL, we can help you with Oracle, um, you know, all, all, the, all the top engines that you're seeing out there, you know, we, we, we work with. Got it, yeah. More questions in the chat? Yeah, we have another one. Um, does the migration of a database to public cloud always mean that the application or applications using it also need to migrate at the same time? Jason, is this something you can help with? Yeah, absolutely. I've actually come across this a couple of times. It, it doesn't necessarily mean it. And obviously you wanna have a, a very good assessment done uh, connectivity is a, a major key in that, you know, if you have uh, a direct connect set up between your AWS environment on premise, or if you're using VPN, um, I, obviously I, I'd highly recommend if you were going to have them separate uh, on-prem to AWS, you, you definitely want to have that, that direct connect in place. So you have uh, the SLAs that, that back that, otherwise you're, you're just kind of hoping and praying on the internet got going out even regardless of the uh, high availability that you may have into that piece. Um, but if you could, the best practice, and, and, and in, in my consulting experience as well, it's always better to have your application as close as possible to that database. Um, and, and then leverage, again, the, the AWS cloud uh, elasticity, use, use availability zones to maintain that high, that high availability. 
Um, and then based on, again, the assessment and everything that you need, uh, make sure that you're aligning them to the right uh, availability groups so you're not crossing over. And, and CloudReach has a, a lot of experience with this and working with them. They, they will help identify those uh, bottlenecks either on-prem or if you're in the cloud with those tools. Okay, got it. Yeah. And also, uh, we have a... Yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, we have a question on, um, could you share a bit more about NoSQL use cases? Um, it's a bit uh, amorphous when it's just called on relational or NoSQL. Yeah, what's the description? Take that one, Kyle. Switching to NoSQL. Um, obviously, yeah, it's, it's a more of a purpose-built database. Um, so whenever you're dealing with uh, unpredictable traffic and you're facing latency issues, you have a global uh, dispersed customer base. Uh, so latency is the key. Um, so the traditional database, it just don't scale horizontally that well. So by moving to a NoSQL database, definitely you get a, uh, the scalability, um, the lighting fast scalability, as well as, you know, it's more flexible in terms of schema, system schema less design, right? Um, so you no longer, you are restricted to that relational. So you have to fill every column in the records to make the, uh, the data is more, more full, right? Um, so it's more flexible, right? Storing short flexible scalability is definitely the key to moving to NoSQL. Okay, um, there's a question on, could it be said that database modernization and optimization is leading us to a standard model of a single type of database in the future of cloud computing? And I think we talked about this a little bit, but basically um, the AWS answer would be no, that different use cases sort of require different technologies like a key value database or a document database that have different performance characteristics and different capabilities. Uh, I don't know, Jason or James, Kyle, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I, I, that's a, yeah, just to reiterate that point. I mean, it doesn't even necessarily even have to be uh, a traditional database. Like, the biggest thing is your mindset going to NoSQL is just understand that that commercial database is was always built to be more of a Swiss army knife, not purpose built. So, you know, if, if you have databases pointing to uh, log files or pointing to video or images, you know, those are things for S3 even. So there's there's lots of ways to to optimize that idea and 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 break those into its purpose built needs with the correct alignment of that service. So, yeah, I don't know if you got anything else, James or Kyle, to add to that, but I think that's the, that's a huge point there. You're right, yeah, I can add a little bit to that. So by moving to a managed services, database services, you're actually focusing more on um, building and, and refactoring uh, your uh, query structures, your schema design. So you're more focused on um, doing the tailored custom made engines for yourself, right? So it's not going to be standard by any stretch. I think we have another question. Uh, yep. If I have an app with the database that I want to migrate, can CloudReach lift and shift them? James, want to take that? Yes, so absolutely. And, and I would say that that's very common, right? You know, uh, depending on where you are on the journey of the cloud, you know, if you're, if you're in that migration phase where you're just trying to get your stuff up there, um, then you can, um, uh, sorry, we, we can definitely help with that because um, those databases have unique considerations. Like we talked about the connectivity, we talked about, you know, some of the management that we can do with, with them. And so sometimes depending on what the application is doing and how integrated it is, that's actually the best thing to do. So we can help with that. And I think the, the, the point of today's call is don't just move your database up exactly how it is, right? Because there might be something where it's just optimizing the licensing, even if you're not ready to move yet to RDS, right? Uh, picking the right instance type. Uh, so licensing and instance type, and, and then having somebody that's familiar with the cloud um, and all those considerations to partner with your database teams to make sure that you've got a plan to win. Um, and, and then, what I would add to that though, is as you go through that journey, let's say you've got some number of databases, um, figuring out, okay, which one of those might align to some of these new patterns that we're seeing? Because uh, we're not seeing databases necessarily go away. We're just seeing opportunities to, to rethink how we manage them. Um, and then also uh, in some cases, refactoring some portion of them. And so we can definitely help you move the database you know, as it is. 
um, and, and help you think about the right things. Great, yeah, that's a very simple answer. And also, yeah, I think James also mentioned, uh, we can help, definitely help with lift and shift, but we'll also look at what is that's the best use case. Um, we also have tools to help assess and kind of recommend what is the best platform for that particular database. Yeah, or the target database will be. Great. Um, I think these, so there's two more questions and I think they could actually be touched on by the same answer. So one is, uh, I don't quite have uh, funding or don't know about funding. How do I get started? Can you help me uh, get through at least the business case approval? And the second one is, um, so now that I'm on the cloud, where do I go for my data protection, backup and recovery? How does CloudReach plus AWS help me with that? So um, James, maybe you can take those because I think they lead to the same answer. Yeah, so, so I would say reach out to us. Uh, there's several different funding programs that we can use to help get started. Um, and we, we've, we've got some assessment funding opportunities um, and so don't, don't let cost or, or having that initial business case, you know, perfect before you reach out, I would say, go ahead and talk to us and we can map you to the right funding. Um, and then we can also make sure that as we help you build that business case, that we can figure out a plan to take care of things like data protection, backup and recovery security comes up a lot. Um, there's ways, uh, within actually these managed database services, there's things like KMS where we can do, you know, secure encryption. Uh, at, at rest uh, for these things. And, and we can also talk about data sovereignty, right? If you've got some requirements there and, and you know, who holds those keys and whatnot so that, so that you can have, you can check all those boxes uh, for your data security officer uh, and compliance people. Um, and then we can also um, figure out the backups. Uh, and a lot of customers that are on, on premise have their own backup tools of choice. And so some of those you can use in the cloud, if it makes sense. But there's also a lot of native backup and disaster recovery components built into AWS. And so what we would want to do with you is just assess what you have um, and see where we can simplify things. Um, and then if you've got any unique requirements that require, you know, you know, some, some third party backup tools, then, then making sure we get those integrated uh, appropriately. So all, all those stuff we, we love to help with. That's what jerks us out of bed every day. So please reach out. Great, I think we're at time here. Um, if you're interested in getting a copy of the slide, please reach out to us and this session is recorded. Um, yeah, you will get a link uh, if you wish to watch it again and um, feel free to send it to your colleagues and friends. And thank you very much. And thank you for the three guest speakers who have on the channel. Thank you, Anna, for hosting. Thank you, everyone. Take care, bye-bye. Thanks, guys.